Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is the 5th of December 2019. I'm coming back with another part of my study. Those that those of you that haven't seen my previous two or three videos, I am basically debating the standard understanding of the online end times community of Christians who believe that there basically have been a gap of about 2,000 years between Jesus's, Jesus leaving after his resurrection and him coming back. So, without going over everything that I said in the pr previous three videos, I just want to recap of what is um, at this moment preached as the truth in the end times community. Now, I want you to understand this is not the only theory that's out there. In fact, most of Christianity don't actually believe in the 2000 year gap theory. Okay? But, okay, let's see what it is all about. So we are told by those proponents of the 2000 year gap theory, or dispensationalism, or whatever you want to call it, is that Jesus came on earth. Doesn't matter when exactly, it's a few years here or there, okay? Doesn't matter. He came, he... He was born, he grew up, he was baptized, he started his ministry, he was killed, and then he arose, then he stayed for a few days, or a month, 40 days or something, and then he left. And then when he left, we've been waiting for him to return ever since, till about now, all right? Now, in Matthew 24, before Jesus is crucified, this is not something that he said after his crucifixion and resurrection. This is something he said before his crucifixion. He is basically speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem that will happen at some point. And he's given the people that are listening to him practical instructions in Matthew 24 and other Gospels too. He's given them practical instructions of what to do when this happens. And then, really, it happened within about 40 years, up to about 40 years from the time that he was speaking about it. Okay? In that time, he also said that this generation, the one that he was talking to, will not pass until these events happen. And I, I was showing all of these verses in a video called, Is Jesus Christ a Liar? In no way I am saying in that video that he is a liar. I'm just trying to make you start looking at certain verses and take them seriously. Because if you don't take them seriously, it's as good as saying that he's a liar. Because saying that certain events didn't happen when he predicted them to happen equals to calling him a liar. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, please pause this video. Go back to the video called, Is Jesus Christ a Liar? The link is in the first pinned comment. Now... The destruction of Jerusalem that Jesus was speaking of in the first three verses and in the whole chapter of Matthew 24 happened up to about 40 years um, after he was speaking about it, okay? And he connected the his second coming, basically. All right, with these events, and he connected the end of the age with these events. 
Yet for some reason, for some reason, the community says, okay, so the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple did happen when he said it would happen. But his second coming and the end of the age has, be, has been postponed till our time now. Okay? Be creating about 2,000 years. Gap. Now, this coincides with a very... Um, very... Hmm popular explanation of Daniel's 70th week or the prophecy in the book of Daniel in chapter 9 it's verses 23 to 27 I think or 24 to 27 and again briefly all right when you do the math it speaks of 70 weeks of years which is 490 years, or so we think. It speaks of about 400, of 70 weeks of years, so 490 years of a time that passes between the rebuilding of the second temple, or building of the second temple, and its destruction, all right? And so it, from the... The way it's mostly understood within the end time community, which again is not the only way to explain it, is that 69 weeks of Daniel have ended around, some say when Jesus came and died and rose, some say when the Jerusalem was, was destroyed, and they have different theories about it. And then they introduced this 2,000 year gap theory, and then they place the 70th final week of that prophecy. They call it the seven years of tribulation, or some say this is 69 and a half, and this is three and a half, all right? Or, I mean, whichever, whichever way they say it. And that the 70th week is between now and the millennium, and then we have the millennium. And this is... 2,000 year gap theory, they call it the grace period, they call it whatever. The prophecy itself does not speak of it. Just go and have a look. It's Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Read it. And find that 2,000 year gap. It's not there. So it's totally fabricated. Okay, there are different ways to understand the prophecy it might be speaking of 70 jubilees it might be speaking of all right there's different ways to understand the 70 years of daniel 70 weeks sorry 70 weeks of daniel but in no way it speaks of the 2000 year gap <clears throat> and so when i introduced these discrepancies and I said, it all already happened. Everything that we're waiting for has already happened back then. I'm being asked, well, where's the rapture? Where is the historical evidence to the rapture? Where is, where is it? And basically what I am saying is this. Okay, we have different ages that the Bible speaks of. And in its simplicity, what I'm trying to say is this. Jesus came towards the end of the previous age from our point of view today, right? And he was speaking of the end of the age back then. And so Matthew 24, which coincides with the book of Revelation, speaks of back then. And then the end came. The harvest was done, and those that remained started over. And now we're at the end of our age. In no way I am saying that he's not coming back. In no way I am saying that there's no rapture. I'm not saying that. If you understood me saying things like that, then you misunderstood. I am saying... There are different ages. 
at the end of each age is a harvest. We have like sh like uh, examples of these harvests throughout the Bible. We know about Enoch and we know about Elijah. Right? And then we know about Jesus departing with those saints that were awakened, basically resurrected. It, it speaks of it in Matthew. And they departed with him. That's another, like an example of a harvest. And it also seemed to happen in stages. It's not just one of event. And so I'm saying there's harvest at the end of each age. Those who are reconciled back to the Father through the Spirit of Christ, as we read in John chapter 17, verses 19, 20, 21, 22. Go check it out. Jesus Christ came so that we can be reconciled back to the Father. So those that are reconciled back to the Father are taken out of here and the rest continues. And then it comes to the end again and there are those that made it and <laughs> they're taken out. And so what we're reading on the pages of the Bible were practical instructions for the people back then in that previous age of what happens at the end of their age. And then they were taken. And I'm, in this video I want to bring the evidence to this. That this has already happened. And then it continued on. And now we are at the end of this age. Which I understand to be the final age. This is the final age. And so of course we are having examples from the previous ages of what might happen. But there are powers and principalities that are trying to make you believe. That what's happened in Matthew 24, what's happened in the book of Revelation, what's happened in other places is for us today. And I don't believe it. I believe that the harvest this time is going to be a tad bit different because it's the final age. We are on the edge of eternity. This would be eternity. This is the final harvest. This is it. We are standing on the edge of the final battle. There won't be any more battles anymore. And so things are going to go a little bit different. So, okay, so I'm going to go now and have a look, show you evidence of the harvest back then, and then from the modern day messengers i'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of the harvest that's upcoming all right so the question at hand is if events from matthew 24 have already happened where's the evidence of rapture back then And to answer this, I need to ask you to ponder for a moment. What would rapture look like from a perspective of a person who didn't get to go? Okay. What would it look like? Well, if we understand that rapture is most likely not a physical event, what I mean by that, I mean your body doesn't really go anywhere. It's, it's, it's your soul and the spirit 
that are taken straight to the Father. You're given a spiritual body and you're taken out of here. So from the bystander's point of view, your body just drops dead and your spirit's gone. They think you died. <laughs> Right? They think you're died. So, we should have evidence of some mass death around the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. And there is one. That's what I'm talking about. It. There is historical evidence to it all right so in Matthew 24 Jesus is speaking of future destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and all that so let's just have a look quickly what what we know from historical sources I'm in Wikipedia yes I know that they bend facts to suit their agenda but if you just keep to the basic facts to the basic points you're okay so let's just let's just introduce this the siege of Jerusalem in the year 70 CE was the decisive event of the first Jewish Roman war in which the Roman army captured the city of Jerusalem and destroyed both the city and its temple the Roman army led by the future Emperor Titus it's not Titus guys it's Titus with Tiberius Julius Alexander as his second in command, besieged and conquered the city of Jerusalem, which had been controlled by Judean rebel fractions since 66 CE, about four years prior. Following the Jerusalem riots of 66, when the Judean provisional government was formed in Jerusalem. In other words, they rebelled against the Roman Empire. They wanted to... They wanted to have their own government, they wanted to be their own country, governed by themselves, not to be within the Roman Empire, right? So they rebelled, Rome sent soldiers, and here we go. The siege of the city began on 14 April 70 CE, three days before the beginning of Passover that year. The siege lasted for about four months, it ended on August 70, on 9 of Av with the burning and destruction of the second temple. The Romans that entered and sacked the lower city. The Romans then entered and sacked the lower city. The Arch of Titus, celebrating the Roman sack of Jerusalem and temple, still stands in Rome. Supposedly. The conquest, conquest of the city was complete on approximately 8 September 70 CE. Josephus, which is a historian from back then, places the siege in the second year of Vespasian, which corresponds to year 70 of the Common Era. All right, so that's just a introduction. Now, okay. <clears throat> We're going to talk about Masada. Masada, which in Hebrew means fortress. By the way, I'm in Jewish Virtual Library. All right. It's jewishvirtuallibrary.org. I'll put all the links down below in the first comment. Masada, Hebrew for fortress, is a place of gold, whichever way you read it and majestic beauty that has become one of the Jewish people's greatest symbols as the place where the last Jewish stronghold against Roman invasion stood. So this was the place, all right, looks like this. It's a big mountain, or big, it's a hill, all right, it's a steep hill. 
All right, and that's where, after the Jerusalem was destroyed, the last remaining rebels held as theirs for a few years. Next to Jerusalem, it is the most popular destination of tourists visiting Israel. More than 2,000 years have passed since the fall of the Masada Fortress. Yet the re regional climate and its remoteness have helped to preserve the remains of its extraordinary story, or so we are told. Masada was declared as UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2001. All right. Geography. Uh, it is located atop of isolated rock cliff at the western end of the Judean Desert overlooking the Dead Sea. On the east side, the rock falls in a sheer drop of about 450 meters to the Dead Sea and on the western edge it stands about 100 meters above the surrounding terrain. The natural approaches to the cliff top are very difficult. Let's look at the map. Let me zoom out. Here's the Dead Sea. Here's River Jordan, is it? What? No. What am I saying? Here's the Dead Sea. And here's Masada National Park. And here. Okay, so if I turn back to satellite, this whole thing. I think this is the this is the hill that we're talking about. And you can see there's the remains of the fortress, okay? Let me zoom back out and change the map. Okay, here's Jerusalem. Here's Masada National Park. I'm trying to see how far away it is from Jerusalem. Somehow I can't see it. Never mind. Jerusalem is a small country. So here's Masada. Here's Jerusalem. Here's Bethlehem. Here's the Dead Sea. All right. Here's the side we're talking about. Okay. So remember Jesus said, once you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, run to the hills. Where well, here's the hills. All right. Here's the hills or mountains. Here is the stronghold. That's where they stood. But there's Northern Palace here. There's just this whole complex was it. <clears throat> That's where they were hiding for a long time. All right. The only written source about Masada is Josephus Flavius, the Jewish war. Uh, the Jewish war book. Born Joseph ben Matiyahu, Mati, Matityahu, okay. Born Joseph ben Matityahu into a priestly family, Flavius was a young leader at the outbreak of the great Jewish rebellion against Rome in 66 CE, when he was appointed governor of Galilee. Calling himself Josephus Flavius, he became a Roman citizen and a successful historian, right? So what did he do? He became Ro Roman citizen to basically preserve his life, right? And he became the governor and he wrote about the events that happened. So we must understand he's writing about them from a perspective of somebody who became affiliated with Rome, not one that was rebelling against it. But that's for a different discussion. According to Flavius, Herod the Great built the fortress of Masada between 37 and 31 BCE. Herod had been made king of Judea by his Roman over overlords and furnished this fortress as a refuge for himself. It included a casemate wall around the plateau, storehouses, large cisterns, ingeniously filled with rainwater, barracks, palaces and an armory. Some 75 years after Herod's death, at the beginning of the revolt of the Jews against the Romans in 66 CE, a group of Jewish rebels overcame the Roman garrison of Masada. After the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 70 CE, they were joined by zealots 
and their families who had fled from Jerusalem, just like they were told. When you see the armies, run! There they held out for three years, raiding and harassing the Romans. Then in 73 CE, Roman governor Flavius Silva marched against Masada with the 10th Legion, auxiliary units and thousands of Jewish prisoners of war. The Romans established camps at the base of Masada, laid siege to it and built a circumvallation, like a wall around it so that they can't uh, so that the people in there cannot run away, okay? They then constructed a rampart of thousands of tons of stones and beaten earth against the western approaches of the fortress and in the spring of 74 CE moved a battering ram up the ramp and breached the wall of the fortress. Once it became apparent that the 10th legion's battering rams and catapults would succeed in breaching Masada's walls, Elazar ben Yar, the zealot's leader, decided that all the Jewish defenders should commit suicide. The alternative facing the fortress defenders were hardly more attractive than death. Flavius dramatically recounts the story told by him by two surviving women. The defenders, almost 1,000 men, women and children, led by Ben Yair, burned down the fortress and killed each other. The zealots cast lots to choose 10 men to kill the remainder and then choose among themselves the one man who would kill the survivors. The last Jew then killed himself. Alright, so we're told that they are surviving in this fortress for three years. Then finally the Romans come. They build something to help them to get the battering rams close enough, okay, to the walls. And as just as they're breaching the walls, everybody inside kills themselves or are killed by somebody. Almost now a thousand people. And this is told to us to be true because of two survivors that have seen it all. Two women. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, let's move on here. I'm just going to recount it again. Masada, for many, the name evokes the Im image of a cliff rising dramatically above the desert landscape. The name is famously associated with the Masada siege the final stand between the Jewish rebels and the relentless Roman army at the end of the first Jewish revolt in 73 or 74 CE. Trapped in the desert fortress palace Herod built in the previous century, the rebels chose, as the Jewish historian Josephus tells us, to commit mass suicide rather than to be captured and enslaved by the Romans. All right. Um, all right, then in this Frontline magazine, we've got the primary source to this. Okay, it's chapter 9 from that Jewish Wars book 7, the way that Joseph has wrote it. And you can read it, and he's explaining how they were, how they decided... Because of the leader, okay, so the leader basically said that it's better to die by our own hand than by the Roman hand. And so, supposedly, each man killed their own family, each man killed their wife and their children, and then there were ten who killed the man, and then there was one out of the ten that killed the the, the nine, and then he killed himself. All right. There are discrepancies to this story. And I'm not going to read it all. So this is one article where Josephus is describing it. And then here's another article where they are from purely 
strategic warfare point of view are are saying this is not correct. It didn't happen like it, like Joseph was just saying. And you can read it, it's not as long as it looks. But I'll give you the bottom line, all right? They were about to breach, the Romans were about to breach the wall. And Josephus claims that just as they were breaching it, they stopped and waited till another day. And that during that time that they waited for another day, the mass suicide happened. And that the Romans couldn't hear anything. Imagine there's a thousand people being slaughtered. Thousand people. And you got the city or the fortress is encircled by the Romans. And they don't hear a peep. And they, the next day they come in and everybody's dead. How did they do it? It's impossible. First of all, they wouldn't stop breaching the wall just before they're done. They would just keep going. And secondly, if there was a thousand people being slaughtered, even though for humanitarian reasons, it would make a lot of noise. And none of that is recorded. None of that is recorded by anybody. Do you know what happened? They survived till the end. They waited till the end, and then they were raptured out. They were raptured out out of here it was the end of age they were taken out 960 inhabitants of Masada they were taken out it was the end of age somebody asked me why Paul didn't write about it well Paul died in what 68 CE this happened in 73 74 CE he Paul didn't get to live to see it. Guys, I can't make you believe anything. All I'm trying to do is this. Go and ask the Father. Go and ask the Father about all of this. But if you're looking for some kind of historical evidence to a mass disappearance of people right after Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed it's right here in the accounts of Josephus they call it mass suicide it, the way it's written doesn't match up I'm convinced that what happened was when the Romans finally got in, they found all these dead bodies. Yes, they did, because their spirits and souls were ruptured out of here. They didn't kill each other, they didn't kill themselves. They just departed. Now, let me open that. Okay, so... Distraction happened. And the rapture happened right after it. And we start a new age. Matthew 24 harvest already happened. And we're coming up to a new harvest. The last one. It's not going to happen the way it's written in Matthew 24 because that's already happened and that's the point that I'm trying to make. I'm not saying there is no rapture, there is no harvest, there is no Christ coming back. I'm just saying the way it was told in Matthew 24 was for back then. Father sent us modern day messengers that have seen glimpses of what's coming ahead and I'm going to do this in part two because this is getting too long okay 
I will gather some visions or dreams from those who have seen it happening at this time. So thank you for listening. And I'll see you real soon again with part two.